so yeah so i guess we'll, we'll just go ahead and start um first things first i've got a, a size 6 b10s which is what i'm going to have as the tail hook um the b10s works really good or the the U, uss from kona is the other one that i i think i put that one on the materials list but I, how are you liking those hooks i mean you put those through their paces are they do they hold up the cone the konas are incredibly strong um the only downfall that i have with them is they're a little bit thicker than the um the gauge wire is a little bit thicker than the gamagatsus and for the most part, this is just that little tail hook, and I just want it to be able to stick whatever it gets. It's, right. So well, you I get the side of my thumb every time. Wire to your advantage if you need the weight. If you need the keel weight, use the heavier hook. Right, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't use it in the tail though. Right. Right. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to use a heavier. The XSS is almost twice uh, the width of wire, or the the gauge of wire. So it will get a lot more weight on that front hook. Um, so anyways, the way the way I usually start these is I will just start by taking zap a gap and putting a little bit just kind of right right up towards the head there, the head of the tail. Um, and then instead of going all the way back to the bend of the hook, I I really only use about this front quarter inch uh, right there. Like for thread. Uh, I've got the Vivas 200 denier. Uh, GSP on here right now. And I, I mean, that's, I started tying with that a couple of years ago and I honestly just order it in bulk now. Okay. It's uh, it's one of my favorites. It, the, the 200 denier really makes bucktail pop really nice too. And most synthetic fibers, like it just puts enough of a pinch on them and it's, it's strong. Um, so here is, here's our first point. Our first point here, we're going to use this ripple ice fiber. Um, you could use other products. You could just use like a, um, I honestly think the best thing to, to replace this with uh, would be bucktail, but I replaced bucktail with this, just so you know. Sheds so water. What was that? It sheds water better. Oh, it sheds water way better. Um, it still has, it still has some rigidity to it, but it still moves a lot nicer than bucktail. And then this, uh, like the little crimpiness that it has to it, um, really just adds a lot of character, I think, and a lot of uh, texture to the to the fly pattern itself. So I just put that guy <clears throat> right on top. You can give it a couple of twists in your hands if you want it to stay together and out of your way. So that's my tail. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty much. It, I, I then take a uh, white craft fur and I go through a ton of different colors. I'll do this same tail in uh, like a copper color with a sand body and then the whole thing is sand. So it, it looks like a little uh, red horse sucker and stuff like that. Uh, so on your, on your craft fur, you're going to want to separate out about an inch by inch square for this tail. Go ahead and And then cut it off. You get that stuff at the hobby store, or do you spend the big bucks with the suppliers? I spend the big bucks with the supplier on the craft fur because um, it's it's really only like, isn't it like six dollars a, a patch anyways? Yeah. Um, but I feel like it tapers down better. I feel okay. like a lot of that stuff from the hobby store will get a lot more uh, under layer in. Like even this will have will have yeah. a fair amount of under layer. Um, but on this particular pattern, I'm going to cut about the last three quarters of an inch of these butt sections off anyways, just because the fly is going to be a little bit smaller. If you make the fly bigger, then you don't have to cut this off. Um, this is like my favorite size for trout and smallmouth and steelhead. So I uh, just keep downsizing it. So you're just going to take those butt sections and push them right over the eye and then gather them all up nice and loosely and then let the let the thread kind of add the weight to it. And I usually get about three wraps on there. And then when you pull down, it kind of smooths itself out for how it's going around that hook. And you can 
advance your thread and just get your thread right to the other side. And then right now is when I, I'll usually go back through with my fingernail. And if there's a, a bump in this craft fur where it's doubled over and it wants to face back the other way, I'll just kind of correct that with my thumbnail. And then good and wet, whip finish it. All right, so next, I'm gonna go for that. Uh, number four, it's the Kona XSS hook. Because I'm usually guiding with these two, I'll usually go through and pinch the barbs down. Um, I definitely always do it on the first one because there's nothing like getting that back hook hooked into a fish and then trying to land it, having it pull the other hook into your hand. Um, go ahead and add your 3 sixteenths. I'm using a tungsten bead. Now on this guy, again, because each time we're starting this, this material and because we're using uh, GSP thread, I always put down uh, just a drop of, of super glue to get things started and to add that traction. Um, Cause a lot of times you'll be tying and we go to put some extra pressure and all of a sudden something will spring off of there for you. Again, same thread, I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna slide it through this super glue. And then I wanna leave enough room for a whole nother bead, even though I'm not putting another bead on. So I wanna, I'm going to anchor it down right above there. And then run this back to where the curve starts. All right. Then <clears throat> tied too many while I was sitting here. So I dig some beads out. I just use these little uh, hobby shop plastic clear beads. I've got them in red and orange and gray they've got in a thousand colors there um personally i really i like them we're not going for weight on these guys we're just going for a little bit of color maybe a could be considered like a gill flash or flare so i'm going to take i've taken this uh intruder wire and i've already cut it into like a four inch long section i've got a bunch of them here I just thread it through and add this add this tail onto it here. Is that the lightweight wire, Hunter? Yeah, yep. You can use the lightweight wire. I've uh, I had somebody try using that Braylon stuff and write me that they thought it was horrible, and that's why I don't recommend it. Uh, the Braylon will break um, usually a lot faster than this intruder wire will. has a little thicker coating on it too, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a little bit thicker coating, but I just don't think like the, the metal can't take as many bends back and forth, I think is its biggest deal. Too brittle. Yeah. Um, so as I put this tail on, the plus side of this tail is it can, it can lay any way and it doesn't matter. Um, and, and honestly, most of the time I'm trying to get it to lay off at an angle a little bit. So in that way, if a fish bites and misses the front hook and comes back, it's gonna hit that other hook. It's gonna find the other hook on its way back. So it just really, I think improves, I mean, it makes sense. It improves your, your hook setting ratio to move that or to slightly offset the hooks. So you start on the near side and you finish on top of the hook with the wire. Yeah, well, I just, so I just looped it over, put it through the bead, and then I have it on my side, I oh, guess, if yeah. there was any side. And then as I turn it, it kind of rolls itself to the top. So it'll be off by about 35 or 40 degrees or so. So it'll line itself up perfect with the corner of the mouth. 
And then since it's just a little bit too much wire, shorten that guy up. And then I, I fold the wire back over and just cinch this as hard as you possibly can. And then I'm going to add super glue layer over the top of it. So that's what you got. Now with the super glue layer, this is another uh, part. Like a lot of times the next step is this uh, UV polar chenille. And a lot of times the UV polar chenille will get caught in Brown's teeth and it'll start to undo itself. So I, I go ahead and put a healthy amount of super glue on here. And then before it gets a chance to dry, I quick try to wrap that UV polar chenille into it. Um, so that way it kind of binds it on the fly side. Um, the polar chenille that I've chose is the UV gold. What size, large? Yeah, yeah, it's the large one. Which isn't there for the most part, it's like large and micro. It seems like whenever I go to order them are the only two that are available, but maybe that's just part of the supply chain. So there. Currently, we've got this fly. Both of both of the hook gaps are wide open because of the material being able to push itself out of the way. Um, our next step is we're going to take. Hang on, I got to look up the actual name for it. Micro braided voodoo fiber, but it's uh, if you look at it, it's basically just a micro barred um, flashaboo. I really like the way it kind of works itself in there. If you don't feel like going out and getting this stuff, it's super easy. You just grab a couple of little uh, tips off of your, your uh, hackle or something like that if you want to add. Or you can, honestly, you can probably skip this whole step. Um, I go through, I kind of pre-stagger some of these tips before I tie them in. That way nothing lines up too much. And then I lay these right on the side here. I'm gonna grab it with thread and I'm gonna have these be my lateral lines down each side. And then whip finish. I apply <clears throat> super glue to these threads, and then I just cram that, uh, that bead head right back over them. Just like that. So I got about that amount of room for one more bead in there. Drop a super glue on there again. Go through a lot of glue. So now you got your thread started. I usually let it sit for about a second or two and just kind of make sure that thing, the glue is gonna hold and everything. Um, our next step is gonna be this ripple ice fiber. Um, this stuff is a newer product in the last few years, same as the white, but this one is, is a olive gold. Um, so it really gets just a lot of the different shiner colors kind of jump out of it. And I like putting it on, I tie it about in the middle there and I just tie it right in front of that bead so it so it'll stick back over the top of this fly like a little mohawk and this is actually you know Mark was talking about keeling and stuff before a lot of a lot of folks keel with the weight of the hook and this fly is actually going to keel off of this little bit more 
flash boot material being on top of it um, since flash boot floats. So then once we got that guy on there and then you advance it back in front, you're by the eye. And I use the sand craft fur. Um, on this one, you're gonna take about an inch and a half square out of that craft fur and, and separate it and then cut it loose. Then again, I don't want the full length. I want it to be right about there. So I'm going to take almost an inch off of this again. Time for some new scissors. Uh, and then this guy, again, we'll reverse tie it right on. Just push it right over the eye. I kind of you know, finagle it a little bit to make sure there's nothing caught on the thread that's going to leave you a big open gap in the bottom. <clears throat> Get it on, started, kind of separate the hair a little bit until it starts laying back for you and then just get that thread advanced to the other side. I can't actually see if anybody else is tying, so I hope I didn't just fly through this. You can always watch it on rerun. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> now, you, don't, you don't tie over the craft fur. You basically make a dam of thread there, right, to flare the material? Um, I mean, there's not really a dam of thread there by any means. It can, it can go the other way right now. Yeah. Yeah. And then once I get it cut, that's where you know, it kind of comes into each person's, you know, I'm sure somebody could write an entire book about uh, the different methods for connecting eyes to a fly. And they're, for the most part, they're just going to fall off anyways. Um, but uh, I've been using this Gorilla Glue gel uh, because I like the fact that it comes out and it just sits there like a nice little drop for me to put an eye on. And I'm too much of a drop. I'm just going to get an eye on each side of it using these little six millimeter eyes. Um, you can use whichever ones you really want. These ones have like the little 3D side of things. They're from Misfit Fly Company, which is a fly shop, Lund's Fly Shop. Uh, takes care of all the packaging and stuff for Misfit. All right, so once those are on, I'll let them sit and I'll let them kind of dry, soak themselves in. Um, but then uh, this Misfit UV Bond is the, uh, the other product that I use from them. I basically just let's see if I can turn this. I put a little bit in between each eye. So I use these eyes almost like a squeegee to squeegee the UV material off of the, the brush that they give you with this. Um, and it really helps kind of pack it in and around there and keep those eyes on there a lot longer. So I'll just touch it on top and then come back through and just make sure everything across the center really is connected because all you really need to hold that craft fur down is, you don't need anything really to hold it down. Once it gets wet, it's gonna lay back anyways. And we'll do it. I notice you don't compress your eyes down. No, for the most part, I because it's got that bead under it, they don't compress down much anyways. Okay, so you want that little bit of a taper. Yeah, I want that, I want that angle coming down.
So does that thing have any like little wiggle or does it kind of? Oh yeah. Yeah. So this, this tail, this tail basically just flashes and flips around in the, in the background. I, mean, I do this in like a silver and a gold and this white pattern too. And uh, it, yeah, it's, um, I feel like it's just almost the perfect bait fish pattern. There's never going to be a perfect bait fish pattern, but um, from back in the day, I mean, when I started tying, this was when I worked for tight lines and it was because I got uh, aggravated that Murdoch minnows would go out there and then they'd sit on the top and nobody would make them dive down, you know, cause you couldn't really make them dive down. Whereas this one, it hits the water and it's ready to go. Like it's, it's already going into the spot. Um, I'll occasionally cut the front hook off instead and leave the back one because the back one's that uh, lighter gauge wire and hook sets the hook so much better. Um, but yeah, other than that, this thing is, I've caught fish everywhere I've taken it, which is kind of the silly part about it. Um, granted, I've done that with a Murdoch minnow too, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think I got, uh, we did brown trout on Black Friday, then I did a bunch of brown trout on the Yellowstone and then drove back and fished the Sheboygan again. And we got brown trout and steelhead again. So, I mean, this is, wow. this will work anywhere you want to go fish a streamer for sure. Um, unless it's incredibly deep and you're not set up line wise to get them there. So when you tie those, mm -hmm. obviously you tie them in different color combinations, but you don't you don't go to all the trouble of messing around with markers and putting dots and bars and stuff on there i i don't bother with it and i for the most part i don't bother with it because for the most part i'm tying it to to be something that doesn't have bars anyways this is just a perfect little shiner minnow um I know that leeches usually don't have red eyes, but I really like the way this fly looks. This is just the black, black version. Okay. Um, and then I can't quite figure out where I've put all the other ones. They're around here somewhere. Um, actually, this this tail you can see just by looking at the tail how that copper and everything is going to come through to be, uh, I mean, out, out west, I would have seen it as being a white fish. Um, and they just annihilated them. Like, it, it was silly. Um, I cut my my buddy, who's a guide out there, was fishing bully buggers. And uh, we, we switched locations in the boat. And he was like, no, nah, you're never going to catch them on that. And I started throwing those bigger flies in there. It was like three casts into it. They just crushed. It was a lot of fun. So the hand comes out from the back of the boat. <laughs> yeah, right. I was I was rowing for him, and I was like, "Let's try this out. Let's. I got this fly. Let's do it. I'll do one of them in that uh, copper color too." Hunter, would you tie this larger for musky? Um, I don't tie it larger for musky. I tie it uh, on one knots for smallmouth. Okay. Um, but really when I'm getting into musky with like a four or five odd hook, the amount of craft fur, because craft fur only gets so long. Um, so that's where the downfall comes in. Then you have to start using bucktail because this ripple ice fiber is so long right. um, and just changing up some of some of the materials to get it up there. But um, I was trying to see. I got, I got some bucks around here. Yeah, so this um, this is like if it was going to be a craft for, or if it was going to be a musky sized innovation. It's going to have this four out hook, and then I put the head portion of it on uh, just a shank, so that way the shank can move, and you've got all this room still for hooking the hooking the fish with it. Nice. Um, and it's connected with a split ring too, instead of uh, the typical old wire, because yeah. the split rings won't break throughout the number of casts I throw. Um, but yeah, that, that guy in a musky size, that that's pretty awesome. And this material that I use on the tail, kind of like the ripple ice fiber is called wampum hair. Um, they also have that through that misfit fly company out of Lund's fly shop over in river falls. And, uh, and that stuff is awesome. It comes, it's like 18 inches long. So you can, you can kind of pick any length that you want that thing to be. Uh, wow. 
Wow. That's definitely what I would recommend. And this, this way is nothing. Nice. It's maybe, it's maybe only got, uh, you know, and you're usually you're tying with bucktail, you kind of measure thing and like what, what it would feel like if there's a pencil in your hand. And this maybe has two or three pencil diameter clumps of bucktail on it. Everything else is synthetic or just a feather. Or this flashaboo if they started doing too, it's like a, it's a drad flashaboo. I really like that stuff. It does have some ripple fiber in there to kind of add some character, but um, for the most part, if I'm going to try to jump it up a size, I need to switch over to this other, this wampum hair okay. material. All right. Anybody else? Like I said, I can't see anybody else tying. <laughs> Um, yeah, let me tell you another. I think we're a group of watchers. <laughs> you, got, you got so quiet. No, it's good. We're, we're, it's like when you go to your aunt's house and everyone's sitting at the table and all of a sudden it gets real quiet. Why? Because the food's good. So, Yeah, so, oh, kind of the, the other thing I was kind of noticing the other day out of these materials, so the, the Ripple Ice Fiber is, an, is a newer product, I would say. It's like, what, four years old or something like that? And it's, it's a little more bristly. And the other product that they came out with is Ripple Ice Hair. Ripple Ice Hair is like angel hair. And only in the black, the silver, and the gold will it be four inches long. It comes in like 30 other colors, but it's basically just dubbing at that point. I don't know why these three or four particular colors seem to be the best ones, but um, if that helps anybody save some time and trouble somewhere, especially if you're ordering it, don't go for all the colors. I have them all. I'll tell you right now, they're not that great. <laughs> just stick, stick with the few colors you need. Um, so I'm going to do one more of those, but with that, uh, that red horse color scheme, at least one more. So again, I'm going to stay about a bead's length back. Wire and the tail. Yeah, it was a <clears throat> maybe a few years ago. I was at this place up north, and this guy who was a bait angler came over and he was talking to me about because we were musky fishing, and he was talking to me about how many smallmouth he caught that day. And sounded just like almost appalling like like we didn't even have to try we just threw it out there and the next thing you know we had another one and i was like well, what were you using and he said they were using four to five inch red horse suckers and that's what they were catching all those smallmouth on kind of thought to myself it's like we're we're missing a boat by only throwing silver silver murdiches okay So how many of those things you blow through in a year? I go through a lot. Pike love them. Um, and I and I don't have quite a big enough eye on there to really feel comfortable putting like a piece of 30 pound wire in it. Um, so yeah, pike, pike destroy these things or they just end up in rocks. Um, I probably, I mean, so far this winter, I've already tied three dozen and I'm just going to keep tying. Um, so you I'm don't... Trying, you don't yes. like that Rio bite guard stuff or what do you use? Um, no, I use some of that bite guard stuff, but there's, there's a lot of times where how I want it to sink is just not how it 
should be sinking if it's got extra wire added to it. You know, it doesn't, it's not going to dive. It's not going to dart. It's just going to go and then run into that wire as soon as you stop stripping again. Um, so that's why I usually kind of avoid it. But they do have that Rio or not Rio. Um, is it USF? I'm not sure. Or S SFA or something like that. There's a company out there that makes one all the way down to 10 pounds. And you um, can find knots in it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I've, I've heard of people using it. I just am not necessarily a fan of it. So I, I don't, I'll lose a few flies. So what do you go with uh, floral? No, I pretty much only fish. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not dressing it up at all, am I? Um, I pretty much only fish. Um, why can I not think of it? Ultra green. Try to eat? Maxima. Oh. Ultra green Maxima. Yeah, I got, just haven't looked at it in a while. I got like five spools of it right in my book bag. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, I, a uh, 10 pound ultra green Maxima is pretty darn hard to beat. Wow. Um, I've got fish on the brule. I've, I've, I've gone to the brule and fished fluorocarbon and had fish grab the fly and break it off or even just hit hitting stuff along the way and trying to get your fly back out of swings that, uh, I just got so sick of it breaking that I just decided, you know what, if it, if it breaks, at least I'll, or if it, if I use this, at least I'll still have the fish or the fly on and, uh, hasn't, hasn't really changed up too much for numbers wise anyways. And you're a big loop knot guy. Oh yeah. 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 I fish loop knots on pretty much everything I can get. 10 pound maxima through the eye <laughs> or or even you know if it's woolly buggers or whatnot but um yeah i'm i'm constantly tying loop knots what and then and then it's like the question is like what's your favorite loop knot well that was my next question but yeah <laughs> i think you're reading my yeah. Yeah. right that's like that's like, it goes anywhere so there there was this knot when i worked for tight lines before i got there that a guy named Jamie had shown one of our customers. And I can't remember Jamie's last name. I know he had something to do with um, Bass Pro Shops fly fishing program in Florida. And I think he was a tarpon guide and something else. But yeah, it's just the single overhand with about a three inch tag. You, you put it through the eye, you go around three times and then back through that overhand knot and it just tightens down. I, if anybody's got a better name than Jamie's knot for it, I, I can't come up with a way to bring it up and show it to you by any means. The same knot. I learned that now. It's called Lefty's Loop Knot. <laughs> oh, now it's Lefty's Loop Knot, huh? <laughs> well, it might have been Lefty's long before it was Jamie's. But, <laughs> but you know, yeah. those Florida guys, when you meet those Florida guys and they can they can tie a bimini in the boat half in the oh, yeah. you have to be impressed with those guys because that's a skill. Oh my God. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just between that and the fact that it, A, it depends on the species you're going after, but the fact that you're trying to chase down something with 40 pound test that should be breaking 160 pound test, like your knots have to be perfect. Everything's got, I mean, it's kind of like our musky fishing to an extent. Um, we're just throwing much bigger flies most of the time. Hunter, how old yes, was sir. this Jamie guy? Oh, I don't know. Uh, the guy, the customer that I used to have, he was already retired and close to 70, yeah. I think. And that was probably about 10 years ago. So, Because I know a really good guy down in Florida named Jamie Brody. Oh, yeah. See, I have no, I have no yeah. idea what his last name was. <laughs> he got me my first bonefish. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, all those all those useless little tidbits of information I've carried with myself all these years. It's one of them. <laughs> oh, it's 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 good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, if only I could remember where I put my whip finish.
Yeah, I wonder. I'll have to, next time I see Bob, I'll have to try to figure out what Jamie's actual name was. He'll probably just comment on here. Like a, a year from now on YouTube. Yeah. My name's not even Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were friends. <laughs> I've been going by Javier now. So tell us a little history about this thing, how it started and how it evolved into where it is today. I'll tell you. So originally I tie a lot with my buddy, Dave Pinchkowski, and he has the bad hair day, which is basically just craft for reverse tied three clumps of it and like a minimal amount of flash. And that's a tandem, yeah. tandem ring Two. not two. usually, usually his is only a single. All right. So then, so since the craft fur is the first thing that wants to follow around my hook every time, right? it drove me insane. And, and Dave wouldn't, you know, didn't want to change anything with the plan. So I, as, as years go throughout, it's like, how can I come up with the same thing? The idea with Dave's bad hair day is it has no weight to it. And if it's on a long leader and a loop, uh, loop knot, then you get a great little walk the dog effect to it when you're swimming it back. And I wanted this thing to be able to do the same thing. Dave will add lead to it if he needs to and stuff like that. So um, just kind of feeling through. And like I said, the, the ripple ice fiber was a big change when all of a sudden that stuff wouldn't, wouldn't fall around my hook anymore. That was great. Um, but yeah, there's been, I mean, I used to do it all as like one big dubbing loop. Uh, going forward, at least on the head, the tail always kind of stayed the same, but um, kind of moved around quite a bit. You've always tied it as a tandem fly. Uh, no, not always as a tandem either. Here's a, this is a single. Leaving that craft, craft for regular length. And then I used uh, some of those uh, feather tips on there. Okay. Heckle feather tips. And that one's been used a few times. This one, I mean, this one also has, uh, instead of just putting the one big clump of bucktail or the craft fur on there, that one has a rabbit strip that's been, you know, the hair has been peeled off and it's been dubbing looped and stuff like that for the head. And How do you feel about those EP minnow head brushes? You like those, those little short ones for the head to finish it? Yeah, like, like that like that yeah i've got i mean i've got maybe <laughs> shorter than that i think they're if like it's, if it's in the hairline catalog i've probably got it <laughs> god it's gotten a little out of hand down here in my basement um but yeah they make some some real tiny ones too and i almost feel like that would act better as a, a rib so like if you were to hold that and your hackle next to each other and then as you went forward on a fly you wrapped them you know like they do on some spay flies and some of those older style salmon flies. Well, you like could get it. Like a complex twist or? Yeah, except I wouldn't even twist the two, okay. the two together. I would just leave them separate and, and you know, do one and then you could almost go back through and do the other one right in between the layers. Um, I think that would look really cool. I've got, I think I've got that material here in Olive, but I haven't played with it yet. Well, the wire is very durable. So yeah, you wouldn't have to worry about that falling apart. And it gives you the little bit of weight too, which is nice. Right. Where was it going here? So just a moment ago, got it right here. So this is that gold, instead of using the ripple ice fiber down the back, this is that gold ripple ice hair just kind of that's not the ripple ice dub right no no this is so this is like four this is like four inches long then they have that and now they have the dubbing yep yeah, yep I've and got some of that i'm going to start playing with yeah good got it so that yeah. ripple ice, and, and you know what my favorite color is is that smalt blue okay yeah i use that on everything just a little <laughs> bit right in the middle yeah what's oh man what was the other one there was like northern lights was one that was yep it's just gorgeous you put that on a black it, fly and it just moves it and undulates it's alive yeah it's yeah 
So then again, sometimes you just got to spread that back out because that craft fruit kind of likes to bind sometimes. You just want it to be evenly distributed. So those three tight wraps is all you need to hold that in place. Yep. Yeah, it's not going anywhere, especially once you hit it with that glue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I was and another thing that some folks had brought up with me about this particular pattern is those uh, the fish, fish masks. Yeah. And and those things they 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 pinch the fiber down and you get an entirely different swim out of the and I know when you tie this, you keep that stuff very blunt and very flared, and you don't press your eyes down. And right. I think yep. that's all part of the hydrodynamics. Yep. Yeah. I want this thing to stop, pause, turn. If I if I need it to, a, a lot of times when I'm stripping this back, it'll be like a you know, very forceful strips so that way this little guy should be just throwing a little pulse out when he's down there yeah. um, you know like the strip twitch or whatever somebody called it but um, when you pause it for set to, for the next strip the tail whips around a little bit gives it some motion yeah but it's not nearly as like um so a lot of folks are really in love with these game changers now and they're a bitch and, high. <laughs> They're a pain in the ass. And when was when was the time? Like, if you have ever looked at an aquarium, we I've always had an aquarium as a kid, and even those goldfish with the big tails, there has never been a time where I have seen that goldfish or any other type of fish try to grab its own tail. Right. And then and then so often when I've got one of those game changers on there, and I just want to pause it, I can just watch him, you know, curly key right around like he's trying yeah. to grab his tail, and it's like no, <laughs> yeah. You're blowing it. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's another thing with these, um, the way I'm putting the wire on and adding that back hook. Um, I mean, yeah, he's loose, but he doesn't, he just doesn't have that ability to, you know, like I said, come around and bite his own tail. So you made that thing about as snag free as you can after all this time. You know, I, you I, I, I mean, I'd like to think it, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I mean, I experimented around a little bit when they first came out with jig hooks, even to try to tie these on jig hooks. So that way you could bring them back hook point up, but that, that changed too much of the swim. So it's back to this. What do you seem to feel is your ideal length for that fly that seems to give you the best presentation and action and castability? So Honestly, this this size is the castability, and then when you add the one knot hooks, um, like if you were to tie this on a one knot hook, you just see how much longer that in itself is going to make it. So maybe the fly would be about you know about that long once you tied it on there. And as as long as you use the full length flashaboo at that point, and you try to just extend stuff out, it still swims really great. Um, when it gets up to that size, I don't put eyes on it. Okay, and you never change your stinger hook. Uh, no, the stinger hook, the stinger hook changes too. It changes to like a, a four. I think it's a no. I think it's a number one actually. Oh my gosh! Yeah, a one and a one knot. Wow. So there's some there's some importance about some symmetry because you just go up one hook size back and forth front to back. Yeah. It, it well, and you kind of got to. You have to know that it's got to be the same hook too um, that you were using before. So then that way you've got the same weight 
difference between the two hooks uh, so for the wire for the wire gauge. A little more weight in the front. Yeah, yeah. I'll always shoot to have a little bit more weight in the front. Some of the big um, musky flies that we tie, which are up there. Um, so to get these to get these guys to swim like we want them to, I actually have a dumbbell weight in here tied to the back of the front shank. Wow. And that, that as soon as you stop stripping, kicks it to the side. Okay. Um, just kind of pushes it through. So the follow through is what gets it to kick. So by adding that little bit of weight in there, each one of these has a, a big dumbbell on the back. Wow. You throw that, what, on a 10 weight? Yep, um, 10s and 11s. Um, the, a lot of manufacturers are coming out with those new 10 plus rods. So I've got a couple of those G Loomis NRX 10 plus. Which is rod. Right, longer than 10 feet. Oh, a 10 no, feet. they're, they're, they're still nine foot, um, but they're just built to throw big flies versus, you know, if you're looking at a 10 weight, if you, if, so if you wanted to go tarpon fishing, somebody would tell you to bring a 10 weight and your 10 weight is des for tarpon fishing is designed to throw a fly this big. Right. And that's, that's kind of the big hiccup is over the last few years, all of a sudden companies have come out with predator rods. Well, then other companies say, oh, that, you know, they shouldn't need a predator rod. But if you really, if you're going to go chase muskie, I would either recommend getting a predator rod or getting a rod that is labeled a 10 plus. Sage has one and Loomis has one and a couple other manufacturers have them. And they, they basically, you're looking at them side by side, they, they're almost identical, but you go to cast them and like on the NRX 10 plus, it's a two piece rod and the butt sections is like 18 inches long. Um, so all day long, you're not messing with the added weight in the, in the top. And you're also not messing with ferals that wanna fall apart and get loose. Um, they're just really designing these things to go to war now versus- it balances the rig better for what you're throwing. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. There you go. Hey, while we're finishing up here, Hunter, let everybody yeah. know uh, how they can get in touch with you, where they can go to find out what you have to offer this year and, you know, how busy are you right now? Are things filling up and, and uh, you know, yeah. So, so currently things are starting to fill up. I, we've got a website, we've got Instagram, Facebook, uh, Vimeo, YouTube. Um, and I, I try, honestly, I'm better about making video contents of people's trips and getting it on YouTube than writing a newsletter. Um, just the just sheer sitting down and taking that time just seems to be too tough. But um, yeah, stuff is starting to fill up. I've, I've got about 40 trips already booked. Um, Gabe's already got about 30 trips booked, um, which doesn't seem like a lot, but last year I topped out at 108 and I think I could still probably do another 20 or 30 trips beyond that because we're opening this trout fishing, uh, up earlier in the year and really spreading our season out. So, um, so yeah, our, our, our website name is wisconsinflyfishingcompany.com. I'm out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Um, but we guide primarily i mean we guide in wisconsin but we guide where we need to be to have the best fishing so like during our trout season we go down to the Viroqua area we're not going to stay up here and fish the rush uh with everybody else from the twin cities um and then once our smallmouth season comes then we come back up here to where you know we've kind of we've been up here now for 12 years yeah 12 years um so we know all this water really well. And then once, once musky fishing comes, we switch out for that. And then steelhead, we go, I do float trips on the Sheboygan. And then we also do walk and wait stuff up on the Brule, but uh, because the Brule is just a mean, a mean river, uh, usually for people waiting and, and just getting into places. I usually don't recommend it unless I got somebody that really has it on their bucket list. And they can tell me to my face that they're okay with walking about four miles in their boots. Um, that's, that's, that's how you get on the brule. Uh, other than that, I don't usually take customers up there okay. uh, just because it's mean. Does anybody have any questions for me? Guys, don't be bashful. <laughs> 
Hey, Hunter. Hey, how you hey, doing? It's, hey, it's Mike Allen. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Hey, buddy. Hey, I, I just wanted to let everybody know uh, that we've fished the last oh. two seasons here with Hunter, running our group trips up there. And if you want to see any of those rivers up there that he guides on, this is this is the guy you want to go out with. He's got plenty of guides. He knows <laughs> all that water real well. Puts on a good show. Yeah, we definitely do our best. That's all you can do, right? <laughs> <laughs> you do a fine job. Thank you. What it is ain't a easy. popular trip? Yeah. For, for sure. The, I mean, each, each season we kind of have a popular trip. What I'd really like to be able to do is just be like, on this weekend, we will just be trout fishing. Let's all go. Um, but um, unfortunately, the boats would just fill up so quickly that it, it would be hard to do that. I've, and that, that's what will start coming up, probably. Um, so like April, uh, I talked to Mark, April 15th through the 17th right now, we have a VRBO in Viroqua that's available. Uh, it's four four bedrooms, four entirely separate bedrooms downtown Viroqua, and and they only want 190 a night for it. So if if guys want to get together and take four people and split the cost of that and split the cost of three days of fishing, it ends up being I think it was close to four thousand dollars for the whole three days of fishing though, and lodging. But yeah, if there's if there's ever any group things that come up like like Mike has found out if there's any group things that come up and you need a suggestion on a place to stay or anything like that, let me know this time of the year is usually the best. Uh, once, once May hits, I usually don't get to touch the phone until about eight o'clock at night. And then I'm usually driving through the North woods. So it's going to cut in and out. And um, I'm sure anybody, anybody that's familiar with it, I, I send out a lot of text messages throughout the summer. I'm sorry. This is what I can do. Um, so yeah, this, this is definitely the best time of the year to try to plan anything, especially if it's going to be more than just two people. Did you go over the, the leader you use on that fly and, and the, that brand and the, and the length that you, you would suggest? The, so the leader I would use for this fly would probably only for the most part, for what I'm going to be using it for, it's going to be three feet or so of maxima 10 pound ultra green and then from there it's going to connect with a loop to loop directly to my sink tip fly line um i've i've been taking uh rio makes a sink tip material that you can weld yourself granted most people probably don't need 50 feet of it but if you i have it uh t8 through t20 uh cut into three foot long sections and then loop to looped on each end uh, you can melt the material back together and re-weld it. And I don't know if anybody else there has tried it, but uh, they're, those short little um, sink tips are just fantastic for turning the fly over and not changing your cast. You know, we've all had that like sink tip, whereas it flies past you, you see it, you know, yeah. flail out the other way. And this, this seems to get rid of all that and still get your fly down at a decent pace. It kind of changes any floating line into like an intermediate line. Really? I mean, you yeah. got to slow your cast down a little bit, right? I mean, not so much. Not it's it's really the length of that that sink tip. If you make it longer, then you would have to. Okay. Um, but just having that two or three feet on there, and I like I said, I have the whole range because sometimes I get people that show up down there that only want to fish a four weight, and other times I got you know people who are making me tell them to put their eight weights back in their car. So it's it's kind of a whole variety of lines that I got. They kind of work together, but um, yeah, those sink tips. I think Jeremy used to have those that material at the shop, and I think he could even weld it uh, there at the shop. But I don't remember for sure if he's still totally doing it. The trick is actually uh, Doug. Doug showed me the trick that you can weld that material. So Doug from DuPage Fly Shop. <laughs> well, does anybody else? have anything more for our very gracious uh guest this evening you've been uh very accommodating we appreciate everything you've shared and hopefully you guys will see the value in this and give them a call and get hooked up and uh go out and have a great time yeah thanks. when you thanks for when you
when you have these rods like 10 plus, uh, what uh, lines do you put on them? Um, so <clears throat> most, most of the lines I'm using are gonna be scientific angler lines. Um, on the 10 pluses, scientific angler makes a musky line um, that has, I think it's a type six sink tip and then it's a type three before that. Um, really, you're just gonna want a, a heavier musky line. It really depends on where you're going as well. Um, Cause you know, if you're only fishing a foot and a half of water you don't wanna put uh, T T 20 on there and drag that thing down into the bottom right away. So it's really gonna depend on the water that you're going to. But for the most part, I have a scientific angler jungle Titan taper is one that I use and that that one at higher temperatures, it doesn't coil up and it doesn't get sticky, which is really nice about it. Um, and the other one that I use a lot is the triple density scientific angler. And I believe it's the one that goes from intermediate to type three to type five. So you get that even descent to your fly line and you don't get that loop that wraps itself around every rock and log before a fish gets a chance to eat your fly. And very castable and you can pull the fly off the water before you have to strip it all the way to the damn boat. Uh, not if you're musky fishing. No, I'm just saying though, small <laughs> mouth fishing is a beautiful line. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a great line. I, I love that that jungle taper one or that jungle temperature one is, uh, is just awesome. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it really depends. It depends on the person too. I, I know Gabe, one of my, he's my full timer. Um, he's been fishing an 11 weight with like a 400 grain intermediate line with then one of my little sink tips added to the end of it. And he, he's just infatuated with the way that thing swims. So it's, it's kind of all, it's all in the person and kind of experimenting around a little bit. Um, usually the best way to do that is to get in a guide boat where they've already experimented around a fair amount. And then you just get, get, you get to go up and maybe buy two lines instead of eight lines. Uh -huh. Well, Hunter, we thank you for your time. Uh, you've been absolutely very, we appreciate it, and I hope you guys take him up on an opportunity and go out and fish with this guy. Yeah, otherwise, I'll keep harassing Mark too. We'll see if you can totally get you guys to do a group trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not everybody screwed up. It's just it's stupid down here. So we're just being. Yeah. And, we're and that out and we're being cautious. Yep. And that's that spring trip too. If if you know it ever comes up, we don't have to stay in the VRBO. We can get a right. little hotel, anything like that. Just just let me know. We'll get it all set. We'll make get it you happen. guys on the water. That's the most important, right? That's what we want. Yep. <laughs> all right, buddy. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. We appreciate Thanks you. Thanks so much. It was awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Cheers. Have a good night.